So today, we're going to pick up where we left off in December. In December, we were going through uh, the beginning chapters of Luke, Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. And in Luke 1 and 2, what we find is the, uh, the first arrival account of Jesus. Uh, the Latin word for that is Advent. That's why that season is called Advent. It's the first advent of Christ, the first arrival of Jesus, and all of the events surrounding it. And it's hyper-focused in on the families. We're looking at John the Baptist, and John the Baptist's mom and dad, and we're looking at Jesus, and Jesus' mom and dad, and families are connected. And there's what comes to the surface is this attention to detail when it comes to people and family. Well, we're going to pick up where we left off in Luke 2. We're going to start today in verse 41. We're going to finish Luke 2, and we're going to go through Luke chapter 3. But I do want to let you guys know in 23 through 38 of chapter 3, there is a genealogy of Christ, and I'm not going to read that out loud. We're going to consider that covered, but I won't make you sit here and listen to me read all of the the names of Jesus' family tree. But we are going to touch on why it is important that it is there. So just managing your expectations on where we are. We're starting in Luke 2.41, and we're going to go through the rest of three. Where we pick up the story today in 2.41 is 12 years after where we were in December. This is 12 years after the birth. They're about to go, the family is on a trip to Jerusalem, and they're about to celebrate Passover. There's a good chance that this is probably Jesus' first time in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover because he's old enough now. There are texts that would have been around in the first century that Jewish people would have used to inform almost like commentaries on how you interpret the law. They're called the Mishnah. And according to the Mishnah, at 12 years old, you are starting to become a man and your accountability to the law starts to increase. So Jesus is present on this trip and that's where we're gonna jump in. So go to Luke 2, 41 and let's start. It says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. And his parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Now, before you freak out that Mary and Joseph were delinquent parents and they don't know where their son is, this is actually pretty common. When you would travel to Jerusalem in order to protect your family against bandits on the road, you would travel in large groups, sometimes 20, 40, 50, up to 75 people are traveling at a time. You do this for safety in numbers, and you travel with your family and everyone that lives in town with you. And so when they're heading back, it would not have been uncommon for Jesus, who was 12 years, to maybe be playing with some other friends, or maybe he's with an aunt or an uncle. It would not have been strange when the group was ready to head home that they didn't exactly know where, it was, where Jesus was. Now, a day passed, and I guess the 24-hour time period, that's when things got weird. <clears throat> because they're starting to look around like, okay, where is Jesus? So at this point, they turn around and they head back into Jerusalem. So verse 45 says, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers and listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. But he went down with them and came to Nazareth and he was submissive to them. He wasn't rebellious. He was submissive to them. But he knew who his father was. Verse 51 ends, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, most of us in here 
are not Jewish. The majority of us in here are Gentiles, meaning we have a very limited understanding of the festivals that these folks would have participated in. See, no one in this story is Gentile. These are all Jews, and they're all celebrating things that for thousands of years Jews have celebrated, and they're doing it in a very specific way. And when we read this text, we read, okay, they went to Jerusalem, know where that is, they celebrated Passover, kind of familiar with it, and then they went home. And we miss the entire coloring of this story. So what I want to do today is I want to pull some material from a commentary by a guy named Kent Hughes, his Luke commentary, and I want to color in for you what was happening at this Passover festival. So Passover, if you remember, is tied to the Exodus story. It's the time of Moses, it's the time of Israel being in bondage in Egypt. They were enslaved by Egypt under forced labor and they cried out to God to save us. And God sent a man named Moses and his brother Aaron to speak for them, to declare to the Pharaoh, you need to let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said no. And then what was released on Egypt was a series of 10 plagues. The final plague was what this festival Passover is connected to. The Passover that night, what happened was the people of Israel were told, God is gonna kill the firstborn of everyone in Egypt, and if you want your firstborn spared, you will kill a lamb, you will smear its blood on the doorpost post of your home, you will cook that lamb, you will consume it, get it on that sacrifice, you will get that sacrifice on the inside of you, you will sit around a table and you will eat with your shoes on, ready to go, because I'm gonna deliver you this night, and that night, God killed the firstborn of every, everyone in Egypt, but he spared the children of Israel, and they were set free. Now this happened at the time of Moses. This is 1,500 years before this period. And what you have during this festival is a family under the command of the law to go to Jerusalem and celebrate this festival again so you won't forget that your God saved your people. And this is what it looked like. The family would gather and they would travel in large groups down to Jerusalem. No matter where you were, you were expected to be there. The law commanded that every male be there. Females were not commanded to be there, but we see that Mary, she came with her family anyway. When you showed up, the husband or the father, he would take the sacrifice, the lamb, and he would bring it down to the temple and he would bring his oldest sons with him because they needed to learn how this went. So Jesus at 12 would have gone down with Joseph to the temple at the beginning of the sacrifice. And what he would have seen when he walked up to the temple was 24 divisions of priests, hundreds of priests lined up ready for the sacrifice. And these priests are there to do two jobs. The first job is to burn all of the leaven that had been collected in the household and around Jerusalem on the eve of this event. Leaven was symbolic of things that got on the inside of the bread and puffed it up and made it larger than it needed to be. And so the command was, I want you to get all of the leaven out for this specific festival. I don't want anything that would artificially puff up this festival. And so leaven was collected and then the priests would burn the leaven. That's the first job. The second job was the priests were responsible for this moment of sacrifice. So here's how it would go. All of the fathers would bring the lamb, they'd bring their son with them to watch, and all of the men would line up in rows, and the priests would be ready with basins. And the father would take the lamb, it would slit the lamb's throat, kill the lamb, the blood would spurt out, and the priests would collect the blood in the basin. This blood was for the forgiveness of sin. And once the blood was collected, the priests would bring all the basins and they would come over to the altar and they would spread the blood on the altar. At that point, the father would then field dress the, the lamb, uh, collect all the insides out, every, make it all ready for the meal, and then bring it home. And the family would gather together and on a pomegranate spit, they would roast the lamb. 
Everyone was commanded to pack all of their stuff, be ready to leave that night, put your shoes on, put your outfits on, no one's in pajamas, pajamas, everybody's in ready to go clothes, and we're gonna sit around the table and we're gonna eat this meal and we're gonna sing songs. The songs that they would sing came from Psalm 113 through 118 called the Hallel Psalms. They sat around, they ate, they celebrated, and they sang. And at the end of that event, after all of the singing, the oldest son would stand up and ask his father this question. Father, why is this night different than all other nights? And the father would then begin to tell the story of Exodus to the family and everyone would lean in and listen with anticipation as the father recounted every detail. Now after one week of celebration, because this Passover celebration, it lasted a whole week of of festivities inside the city, everyone would go home and that's where the story picks up when Mary and Joseph are heading home. It's one week later after all of the events and they start heading home and after three days they realize that they don't have Jesus. They go back and they find him in the temple and he says, don't you know that I'm supposed to be in my father's house? Here's what I want you to see This is what I think Luke is trying to show us. And this is why I spent so much time just a moment ago walking through all of the details of Passover. Because what we have here in the first three chapters of this book is detailed information about how families functioned in the first century. I don't want you to miss this. There is details about Zechariah, Elizabeth, their son John, details about Jesus, about Mary, about Joseph. There's details surrounding this entire festival that Luke doesn't explain in detail because he assumes his audience would have understood. But what we have here is a snapshot of a family that follows the Lord. What you see is a father who's leading his family towards the Lord. You see it in Zechariah. You see it here in the Passover festival festivities. But you don't just see a father who treasures God and packs his family up and brings them down to do this festival in accordance with the law to to obey what God has commanded. You also see moms in this situation. Moms who are nurturing and treasuring up all the things that they see. And you also see sons at 12 years old Treasuring a God above all other things. Now, at this point, you're saying, well, Marshall, like, we're looking at Jesus. Clearly, like, the standard for Jesus and his family, it's different than the standard of Jesus, of, of, of my kids and my family. Like, it's not a one-to-one ratio. The, 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 this picture that I'm looking at, it's a picture of what would become salvation for the whole world, but it's not necessarily an example for my family. But here's my question for you. Wouldn't you like it to be? Yes, this story Luke is telling is about Jesus, and he's giving us details about this young man that would grow to become the savior of the world, but there is so much more wrapped in this text, and it it is a, you can draw a straight line from what we're seeing to one word that Luke wants you to understand, family. None of these events are taking place in some workshop or at the mall or uh, in in Joseph's uh, car as he's traveling to and from whatever business he's doing. This isn't happening like at church or or, um, like on your family vacation. Every one of these primary events that we're looking at are taking place within the context of the family. And I think that's important. And here's why I think it's important. Because snapshots like this, I think, stir something on the inside of us. Look, I'm a dad. And when I read this, and I read that Joseph took his family down to Jerusalem and participated in the Passover festival, and I become aware of what that included, there is a stirring on the inside of me that's asking me, don't you want more 
Dad, don't you want more of, of the expectation of God on you for your family? Don't you want to be more of a man that points your kids to the Lord? When you finally expire and they're standing around at your funeral, what will your kids say was the most important thing in your life? Was it golf? Was it your job? Was it the Lord? What do you treasure more than anything? When I look at this story, all I see is a dad who's leading his family towards one destination, and that is the Lord. And what I want is that for my family. And what I want is that for your family. As we kick off this year, what I want is a stirring in your soul that when you read texts like this, you want more of this in your life. If you're a mom and you read this, you want more of, of beholding God working and treasuring that up in your heart rather than treasuring up the things that this world is telling you to treasure. There, there is a thing that moms often struggle with where they feel like there, there is this imaginary expectation out there of what momhood looks like. And it doesn't matter what you do, you're not doing that because the other person down the road who's broadcasting their mom life on Instagram, when you look at that, man, you just never live up. Doesn't matter what you do, you're falling short. What if you stopped treasuring that in your heart and you started treasuring what you see God doing in this little family right here? And we're not just talking about moms and dads. Kids are not exempt from this. We're going all the way down to 12 years old. So if you're a young person in here, from 12 years old and up, there is an expectation on you to start living your life in such a way that you treasure the Lord more than you treasure the things of this world. More than you treasure the reputation that you've built. More than you treasure the attention that you get from guys or from girls or from people who you consider is popular. There is nothing more important than garnering and fostering the attention of your heavenly father. That's at 12 years old. The story kind of shakes you. Because I think what it's showing us is an expectation and an invitation for families to look a little bit different than they do now. And I think this because as we continue through the story, now we're gonna go and pivot into John the Baptist, and we're gonna look at a man who grew up in a godly family like Jesus did, and we're gonna look at the kind of things that produced inside of his heart. What happened to John the Baptist after his dad spent a lifetime as a priest pouring the word of God into John the Baptist? Let's go to Luke chapter three, start in verse one. This is in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the, of the region of Iturea, and Trachonites, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now Luke jumps forward in chapter three in a timeline. We're now at around 27, 28, maybe as late as 29 AD. John is starting his ministry. And the interesting thing that when we start chapter three is that Luke is using political figures and high priest positions to date something more significant, which is just a side for us today. We are convinced that the most significant things that are happening in our world are happening at the highest levels of leadership. And God says, no, 
those are just mile markers to mark the other more significant things that are happening on more local and family levels. So don't look at the news and be convinced that some man you've never met is changing your life. God says that person's tenure in office is nothing more than a mile marker for when I did this significant thing inside of you. Now what is this more significant thing? The more significant thing is God working on earth. We see that John the Baptist is the son, there's that family language again, of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the the, the folks we learned about in Luke chapter one, verses 57 through 80. He spent, uh, John did, he spent his entire life surrounded around temple culture and the word of God. Because his dad was a priest And his dad had this profound moment where he was confronted with an angel who told him, your son is gonna be one who prepares the way of the Lord. And so John spent the rest of his life preparing, excuse me, Zechariah spent the rest of his life preparing his son John to, to fulfill this ministry. Every day, Zechariah is a faithful father who's pouring the word of God into his children. Now, how do we know that? Because when John starts his ministry, it starts when he hears the word of the Lord. And what is the first thing that comes out of John's mouth? What is his ministry known by? It's the word of God. It's the prophet Isaiah. I want you for a moment to consider what does it look like if you were to start rearranging things in your home so that the word of God is the center and not an overly stressed calendar? What if everything in your home as a dad and as a mom in some way pointed your children back to the goodness of God and every day you're looking for ways to talk about the goodness of God, to talk about his ways and his faithfulness and his covenants. What would it be like if your kid at 18 or 19 or 20, when they finally move out, if they had spent 20 solid years of hearing all day long things that point them back to the story, the only real story that makes any sense and is of most importance? Think about this for a moment. Because there's so many times we get sidetracked and we think that this thing over here needs most of our attention and it's most important and it isn't. What we're looking at here is a, uh, an, a, an example, a, a, a portrait being painted of what godly families look like. What is Luke showing us here? Luke is showing us that family is the fertile soil where we first learn to grow. Mm, but that's been flipped in our culture. The fertile soil where children children first start to learn to grow is in public school, outside of our influence. The first place that children start to learn and grow is when you hand them that iPad when they're three years old and they figure out how to start flicking and turning things on and and watching YouTube Kids because somebody out there surely has monitored all of the material on YouTube Kids and it's surely it's good for your kids. Look, I get it, I've raised three. I know how easy it is to say, I just need a minute, so you go watch that thing. And not pay attention to what they're actually watching. And to let that go on over a couple months and all of a sudden you start hearing things come out of your kid's mouth, you're like, where did you get that from? Where do you think they got it from? If you're not consciously discipling your kids, the world will gladly do that for you. Look, if you're sitting there as a couple who just got married, and you're like, man, that, that seems like a lot of work. Yes, good, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> yes, parenting is so much hard work. There's no time off, there's no breaks. You have to be ever vigilant all the time. Because if you're not careful, the enemy will find that back door and snatch your kids up. And he will start in their mind. That's where it begins. Because everyone is born with a sin nature and they want it anyway. 
They're, they, they're born with a lean towards disobedience. And so any culture or discipleship that wants to feed that disobedience, they're going to run towards. They're not going to want to run towards the goodness of their creator. You have to work that on the inside of them through years of loving correction. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Luke painting a picture. We've got prophecy from Zechariah. We've got a Passover scene. We've got the song of Mary from Luke 1 and 2. We've got all of this painting a picture of the value of family being the soil where God plants this message of his. The New Testament calls it the gospel message. This is the good news. Where does the good news start? It starts in the house. I got, look, I got news for you. God chose his people to steward the good news message. You're like, well, that's a no-brainer. Except for the fact that we think that it's other groups' responsibility to steward that message. It's not the government's responsibility to steward the gospel message. It's not public schools' responsibility to steward the gospel. It's not celebrities or Hollywood's responsibility to steward the gospel message. Islam is not stewarding God's message. The gospel doesn't come out of these other religions. The truth comes from one place and one place only. And it comes originally, it fosters from the home. That's where it all starts. Well, you say, well, what about the church? What is the church made up of? Families. And so what Luke is painting for us is a picture that will show us the value of this thing that in our time is under attack. If you want to change the course of the world, you dismantle the family. Because that's where everything starts. If you want a generation to look different, it's going to take you 30 years to get there, but if you can take a child and reconfigure the truths that he's learning in a biblical home, you'll eventually get there, and they'll vote the way you want them to, and talk the way you want them to, and be addicted to whatever you want them to be addicted to. They will be yours if you just give it enough time and you disciple long enough. But Luke is, con is showing us a contrary message. He's saying in God's perfect design, everything starts in the home and spreads outward. Where does it spread outward? It sp spreads outward into the valleys, bringing mountains low, making crooked places straight. That message starts in the home and it spreads outward. Look, it is not the church's responsibility to teach your children the gospel message. Dads, that's your job. Moms, that's your job. And it requires a fostering of reminding yourself of that message on a daily basis while you're at home. Because in God's perfect design, it starts in the home, it fosters, it grows from there, and then it starts to spill out into the streets. Now, you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's not how I grew up. I want to tell you today, that's okay. And you're thinking to yourself, like, I grew up under a horrible house. Like, I, that, that's not, okay, that's God's perfect design, but that's not how I grew up. Well, you've got two choices. You can continue to blame your current situation on the way you grew up, or you can start making different choices today for your family. Those are really your only two choices. I love you, but those are your only two choices. You can allow what happened to you in the past become your identity and get stuck there and never really move out, or you can accept the new identity that your king is giving you today and move forward. The question is, Will you stop living in the past and make a decision about right now? What is gonna happen right now? And if you're making that decision, what is gonna happen right now? Then we have to make a decision about the message, that gospel message that's gonna be sp spilling out into the streets. Because if we all agree, okay, I like what you're saying, I'm on board with it, I'm gonna go home and I'll start doing some things different with my family. We're gonna paint, we're gonna have a little chalkboard wall. I'm gonna put the scriptures up there. Everywhere my kids look, they're gonna start seeing it. I'm with you, I'm tracking with you. Now we have to make sure that we get the message right. Because if you're not careful, you can pour into your kids a false gospel message. So if we're gonna do this thing right, 
If we're going to change the way this world looks and and we're going to start in the family and then it's going to spill over into the church, it's going to spill over into government, it's going to spill into the streets, it's going to spill over into the school board, it's going to spill everywhere you go. You can't go to, to a coffee shop without hearing somebody talk about the Lord. That's the kind of world I want to live in. Anybody with me? I'd love to live in a world like that. Used to be like that for a little while, not, not so much. But I'd love to get back there. But here's, this is how you do it. This is how, this is how a church changes a city. It starts in your house. But you have to make sure that what's being talked about in your house is the gospel message. Because if you call it the gospel message, but fill it with stuff that isn't gospel, your kids will leave your home and what is gonna spill out into the streets is false gospel antichrist message. So how do we know what the right message is? Luke gives it to us. He lets John speak with his own mouth and I'm gonna warn you, you might wanna buckle up because it's probably not the gospel message that you think you heard. Let's listen to what John's message is. We're gonna start in three and start in verse seven. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowd said, well, what are we going to do? What shall we do? And he answers them, well, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. And then tax collectors came to him and said, well, teacher, what do we do? And he said, collect no more than you are authorized to do. And then soldiers came to him and said, what are we supposed to do with this message that you're preaching? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ. And John answered all of them saying, guys, listen, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, and he is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. With many other exhortations, he preached what? Good news to the people. What is this good news? What is this good news message? The good news message is that one is coming to wash away your sins, but this one demands something of you. This one who's coming is laying the ax to the root. This one who's coming has a winnowing fork in his hand and he's sifting away those who belong to him and those who don't. And what determines who you belong to is where you put your faith. Who do you believe in? What is this message that John is preaching? This is the message John is preaching. Repent. 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 You cannot come to Jesus unless you repent. You cannot go to a holy God unless you have turned from your sins. You don't get to bring your sins with him and sit down over coffee to try and convince him that these sins that he has previously said are sin are now somehow not sin because we live in 2024 and things are different now. There's one invitation and that is turn from your sins. The Bible word for that is repent. And then John, he essentially captures the idea of what James is getting at in James 2.26 when he says faith without works is dead. Repent and therefore Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
Here's the thing. It is good and true and right, and I want this for every one of you in here that is not a Christian this morning, to hear the gospel message and to say, I want to turn from my sin. I don't want hatred to live in my heart anymore. I don't want my identity to be tied up in, in sexuality anymore. I, I'm not interested in, in being a thief anymore. I don't, I don't want to constantly be sleeping around to find some sense of identity in my life. I don't want that anymore. I want something else. I want my creator to give me my identity. Praise God. Repent of that lifestyle, but then bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Stop sleeping around. Your vice is alcohol, it's running your life, it's ruining your life. Man, praise God, when you repent, you turn from that, but bear fruit in keeping with repentance and don't go back to it ever again in your entire life. You say, well, that's not possible. Sure it is. I don't drink any alcohol. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin. It's a sin to be drunk. I'm not saying it's a sin to drink alcohol. But what I am saying is that for some of you in here, you don't know when to say no. For some of you, it's not alcohol. For some of you, it's food. You don't know when to say no, and you can't stop yourself. Excess and excess, and, and you can't say no. It's anything that runs your life and gives you an identity. I'm telling you, if you need somebody to look at and say, well, I don't know any Christians that don't drink alcohol. I'm one. I don't do it. Look to me as some kind of confidence booster. It can be done. But when it comes to excess and treating the God, the good God-given things of this world as idols, you have to repent from that and then bear fruit in keeping with repentance and not go back to it. This is the message. This is the good news that's being presented to the Jewish people and then extends over into all of the Gentiles, which is most of us in this room. Repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't think that you can find salvation or peace in some earthly identity. For the Jews, it was being a descendant of Abraham. For us, man, there's, there's a long laundry list. There's no shortage of things we try to find our identity in. And the gospel message, the good news, is telling you today, repent. And don't think that you have to find your identity in that thing in this world. This is the message. Your lifestyle and your self-desires are against him and you have to be reconciled. The ax is at the root. There's only reward and punishment coming and today might just be your day to turn from punishment into reward. And people are receiving this message and they're saying, well, what do I do with it? And John responds with everyday practical things. What do you do with this message after you've repented? Then you practically walk it out. Repent and turn to God, but bear fruit in keeping with the repentance. Stop cheating people. Stop lying to people. Stop taking advantage of people. Stop eating in excess. Stop drinking in excess. Start pa stop partying in excess. Stop sleeping around in excess. Find yourself one good woman, marry her, and ma make a family. Put a ring on her finger, have some children, build a life, and stop spending your evenings chasing women. That's the message. Repent, turn from your sins, embrace the goodness of Jesus, the free gift of salvation, and then bear fruit in keeping with that. And before we continue and go through a little more of the scripture, I want us to kind of summarize what Luke is saying here because he's building a case, I would argue. First, he gave us tons of family language, and he said that family is essentially this fertile soil where people like John the Baptist grow up in and that Jesus submitted himself to. Jesus didn't have to, that's not how the plan had to go. God, in his, in his wisdom, he could have done anything. He could have just sent Jesus, a 30-year-old man, walking out of the woods, hey guys, I'm here, here's the message of the kingdom, listen up. But he didn't, he submitted himself under a family Family is crucial to understanding where the good news originates. It, it's honed at home. It isn't sharpened at church. It's reinforced at church. It's practiced at church, but it's learned at home. And that's why sometimes when you think, well, I don't want my kids, they don't, they don't want anything to do with church. I, I mean, look, I love you, but it might have something to do with the fact that you complain about going every single week. 
If they're sitting in the back listening to you fight on the way to church about things that don't matter, it creates inside of them memories that this thing I'm going to, it's not a happy place. Mom cries every time we go. Dad's always shouting about being late or something. Everybody's, everybody's mad when we go to this place. When I grow up, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something different. Man, what if it's different? So family, this is what Luke is arguing. Family is this fertile soil where this good news message is honed. It grows out of there and spills out into highways and byways, cities, workplaces, and it impacts regular people like tax collectors, soldiers, and even politicians. But it's funny the politicians don't react the way the average people do. Let's go to verse 19. No one was surprised by that. <laughs> verse 19, Herod, the Tetrarch, he's kind of the puppet king at the time, who had been approved, excuse me, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done. What, what is Luke saying here? He's saying that John spoke out against what Herod had done to his brother. Herod had slept with his brother's wife and then married her, and John spoke out publicly that this is sin. John, the prophet John, is speaking against the government and telling them what you're doing is sin, you need to repent. And guess what the leadership did? Verse 20, he locked him up in, in prison. The leaders, they didn't like the message, the good news message. They wanted to do their own thing and sleep with whoever they wanted to and marry whoever they wanted to, and so they had John thrown in prison. Verse 21, now we jump back into the scene at the baptism, uh, um, uh, at the, the, the river where John is doing the baptisms. And when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son. There's that family language again. With you, I am well pleased. <laughs> John's message reached the politicians and government and Unlike the people in the wilderness, the government didn't like John's message, no surprise there. But the last section is really what stands out to me. Jesus is affirmed as the Son of God in Luke, then in verses 23 through 38, pivot back to family. Genealogy. Now I understand what he's doing there. Luke is making an argument that Jesus has a connection to being the Messiah. He goes all the way back to David, he goes all the way back to Adam. His pedigree is connected to the promise. Luke is revealing the covenant, but Luke isn't only revealing the covenant. What Luke is doing here is he's reinforcing with all this family language the importance of the family. So let's summarize, what is Luke showing us? Luke is showing us that at the first arrival of Jesus, this is the setting. This is what you would have seen in the first century. Families devoted to God and that devotion spreading out into normal life. That's what you would have seen. You would have seen this message that started in the family spreading out into normal life being summarized as good news. And the good news is it's glorious to some and it's offensive to others. It impacts tiny little backwater towns and leaders in high positions. Nobody is exempt. So, why is that important for us today? What's the application for us today? Because the picture Luke is showing us the first time Jesus arrived is the expectation that should be going on today on the eve before Jesus arrives the second time. If he's coming back again, what is the setting? What is the church supposed to look like? This is what the church is supposed to look like. Families devoted to Jesus, allowing their devotion to spill over into normal life. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about making a decision this year to take God more seriously, not in your own life, but in your family. Look, I get it. As a dad, there is an 
uneasiness to start talking about things you haven't talked about before. If you historically have not been a guy who makes much of Jesus, but now he's working on the inside of you and he's convicting you right now, he's telling you, you need to fix that. It's going to be weird when you walk home this afternoon, or walk home, when you drive home, when you get home this afternoon, you sit around for lunch and you're like, hey guys, so uh, how about we start reading the book of John together? Your kids are going to look like you like you're nuts. Your wife is going to be like, who is this person? Look, I get it. Same for moms. If you historically have been more interested in the way you look and spend more time at the store shopping or putting yourself together and less time in this word, if you're not interested in the way, in, as Paul would say, adorning yourself with godliness, but constantly adorning yourself with the things of this world, it's going to be weird for your husband to see you start becoming a godly woman. But here's my encouragement to you. Get over it. Because in 12 months from now, no one's going to be thinking it's weird anymore. It's who you are now. God has profoundly changed you. So just get over it. If you're a child in here and you historically have not really cared much about the Lord, but in hearing the word of God preach and the spirit is stirring on the inside of you, like I need to make some different changes in my life, then just go ahead and do it. Let this beautiful but offensive message start stirring on the inside of you and let it spill out of you into your family and then into your church. Start serving in your church. Start talking about it when you're at school. Now, people aren't going to like it. When you go to school and you start asking your, question, your teachers to your questions and they start talking about, well, we're going to have this class on this ideology and this belief system and you start asking questions to poke holes in it, they're not going to like that. Get over it. There is an expectation from Scripture for the family to be the core unit that profoundly stewards this word. It's cultivated and added to as families get together in the church and it spills out into the society. This is what Luke is saying. This is what I'm going to close on. Strong families make strong churches and strong churches preach bold messages. Why is there so many weak messages in churches across the country? It's because there's weak churches. Well, then why do we have so many weak churches? It's because we have weak families. Why do we have weak families? It's because we have weak dads. That's why. You want to fix this? Got to go from the bottom up. The church needs to sound more like John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. We need to get back to our core message and our great commission. Now, obviously, there's no disagreements with that. We're sitting around saying, yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. But how do we do it? How do we change the world that we live in? We don't do it at the church level, folks. You do it at the family level. You want this world to look different? Your family has to look different first. That's where we start. You want stronger churches? You're tired of looking around at any major city in the country and there's two or three like mega churches that are preaching a false gospel and there's a couple small like faithful churches and there's just a bunch of mediocre churches and you walk in, it just seems like they're trying to reproduce the same plan that somebody handed them and you feel like you walked into a McDonald's that you could have seen in Detroit or, or Tallahassee. It doesn't matter where you go in the country, every church has been franchised and they all look the same and they're all talking about the same thing. You know why that is? Weak families. You want to see that different? You want, the, you want churches over the next 20 years to look different? Here's how that happens. You start in your home. You're like, well, what difference is that going to make? It's going to make more difference than you could possibly imagine. Because everything starts in the home and spills out. I've had lots of conversations with people about changing things, specifically in this city. We want more gospel influence in, in politics and school boards and classrooms. Man, praise God for all of that. We want more of that. But it doesn't start by just running for the school board. Because if you can't manage your own home well, you don't have any business managing the school board and the homes of other people. 
If you can't manage your own home, you don't have any business managing a church. The proving ground for your character and whether you can actually do this thing is at home. Does your own wife follow your lead? Does your own children follow your own lead? If they don't, maybe you're not the guy. But maybe you could be the guy. Maybe you could be the gal. Maybe you could be the person that God's called you to be. But here's the core message, and it doesn't feel good, just like John the Baptist saying, hey, brood of vipers. It doesn't feel good to be called a brood of vipers. But here's the truth. You want things to change? You want to say yes to this thing God's told you to do? You need to make sure that the proving ground has been has been fortified and turned over and is ready so that when you get to that place, your character keeps pace with your gifting. Because you may be unbelievably gifted, you may be charismatic, and when you stand before a crowd, people, are, everybody listens to what you have to say. But if your character is not at pace with that gifting, you're not gonna last more than a year anyway. The enemy is going to take you out. All it takes is sending one beautiful girl before your path because you're so charismatic and everybody loves you. You're going to fall for that one girl and all of a sudden, guess what? Your proving ground has been completely eroded because you fell and you had an affair. Or you can't control your anger. That's your issue. And so once you get the opportunity to lead, you crush everybody into dust because you don't know how to control your mouth. Where do you learn that? You learn that at home. This is the beautiful message of Luke 3. You want to change the world, you have to start with the family. The gospel message was birthed out of a family. It was reinforced in the family. It's cultivated and built and strengthened in the local church. But if we want our world to look different, as we chart our course for this year, you cannot avoid the elephant in the room, and that is, it's time to take inventory of our family. Amen? Let's pray. Mm -hmm.